Okay, so we are now live uh, with another session of open neuroscience and open source tools for neuroscience. Um, this is a cooperation in between open neuroscience and the worldwide series. We are very, very happy to receive to have today Adam Tyson uh, to talk about the Brain Globe. Um, Adam is a neuroscientist and a software developer at the Sainsbury Welcome Center uh, in UCL. Um, and he did his PhD in neuroscience at King's College in London and a brief stint uh, at the Institute of Re Cancer Research. Um, then he moved to UCL to develop open source neuroscience data analysis tools. Um, Adam co-developed CellFinder, a package uh, for data for analysis of the whole brain, micro of whole brain microscopy data, I'm sorry, uh, and co-founded uh, the Brain Globe Initiative to develop tools and open standards for computational neuroanatomy. Um, thank you very much, Adam, for accepting our invitation to present your work. We're very happy to have you here today. Um, and if you're interested in this after this talk, like there is a brief um, description of the project in, in open neuroscience, but I'm pretty sure Adam is also going to share more links and more places where you can find uh, more information. And on the video description, we also have links um, to the Brain Globe, the repository, and to the documentation and the Twitter account. Um, so, Adam, if you want to share your screen, the floor is now yours to give your talk. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Brain Globe, which is um, a project to develop open source, interoperable uh, Python-based tools for computational neuroanatomy. Um, so, Brain Globe is first of all, it's a collection of tools. Um, and it's also an effort to try and develop open standards and to build a community to develop open source tools for neuroscientists. Um, there's a collection of tools which I'm going to talk about briefly in this talk, the first of which is the Brain Globe Atlas API. This is a Python API that allows you to interact with brain atlases in a standardized way. And this is kind of the center of the Brain Globe suite of tools. All our tools are based on this, and that's why and how they end up being interoperable. We also have then tools for the visualization and analysis of um, specific types of data. So the cell finder, which is an integrated software for um, efficient cell detect 3D cell detection um, and registration of large whole brain microscopy images. BrainReg, which is the standalone registration package um, for uh, multi-atlas registration of large whole brain images. BrainReg segment for segmentation of bulk structures within the brain, things like um, injection sites, lesions, uh, probe implants, and for validating anatomical segmentation based on multimodal data sets. Brain Render, which is our visualization tool for visualization of multimodal data in Atlas space. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about some of the more recent tools that are currently being developed. Um, Pro Planner for um, planning the trajectory of implanted devices in Atlas space. Um, slice reg for um, kind of a 2D companion to brain reg for registering 2D sections to a 3D atlas. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing to try and make some of these tools as easy to use as possible um, and also interoperable with other software um, by developing plugins for the multidimensional image viewer and the PARI. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we're trying to build a community around these tools, to kind of sustainably develop them um, and develop a, a suite of interoperable software. So a little bit of background about the Brain Globe initiative. Um, we were developing, at the Sainsbury Welcome Center, we were developing software for the visualization and analysis of various um, neuroanatomical data sets. And we realized that there was kind of a limitation both in our software and in a lot of the other software that um, other groups were developing in that nearly all software requires a brain atlas. People want to either register the data to a brain atlas, maybe they um, Allen mouse brain atlas, or they want to segment out their histology data um, or other data based on an atlas. They want to divide the brain up into different brain regions. And our software only used one uh, brain atlas. Um, and other software, even if you use the same atlas, it's very hard to compare the results because um, often they implement the atlas in a different way. They might use a different file format or they might use a different orientation convention. Um, and just subtle things like that make it difficult to compare. And also now there are 
a choice of atlases. I mean, we typically work in mice where most people use the Alan Mansbrain atlas, but now there are a number of different atlases being developed, um, maybe with additional data or using completely different ways of par um, kind of parcelating the brain. And most software only uses one and you can't pick different atlases. And then finally, kind of more fundamentally, we also realized that we're working in a single animal model species. Um, and now one of our collaborators from the Max Planck Institute of uh, Neurobiology was working in fish and wanted to do similar analyses. And we realized that everyone is trying to solve a lot of the same problems across atlases and across animal species. Things like segmentation of structures, registration to atlases, um, fish and 3D visualization. But a lot of people aren't collaborating because the software that they're working on only works on one species. So we thought if we could come up with a way of making it easy to switch between atlases, then people can focus on implementing the software and not on the specific application, the specific atlas or the specific model species. And so we developed the BrainGlobe Atlas API, um, which if you're not interested in kind of developing software, well, I'll skip through this bit quite quickly. But basically what we do is we packaged up different brain atlases at different resolutions from different species. We package them up in a standardized way. And then when you write your software, rather than loading specific files off disk, you can instantiate this Python object, this BrainGlobe Atlas class, and you tell it what atlas you want. So you say, I want the, for example, the Allen Mass Brain Atlas at 25 micron resolution, or you want the Max Planck Institute um, Larval Zebrafish Atlas at one micron. And then once you have this class, this Python object, you can then access various um, things you might need to work with an atlas. So you can get the reference image. This is the structural image that the atlas is based on. You can get the annotations image. Um, which are the different brain regions. Then you can get the meshes for doing 3D visualization, or you can get, um, you can do various kind of querying. So you can see all the metadata about the atlas, who made it, um, what species it's in. And you can query, query, for example, if you have a coordinate, you can see which brain region that's in. Um, and this is important because it means you can write your software um, based around this atlas class. So you can define a specific atlas at the beginning. But then you can use exactly the same software by changing this one line. You can use the app at different resolution, you can use different annotations for the same species, or you can use it in a completely different species. So the aim of this, um, this Python API is to really kind of firstly reduce the amount of um, duplicated effort because people are implementing the same, um, same computations over and over again. It's to increase interop interoperability between different um, between people developing software in different model species um, and al allow people to kind of compare software much better. So we have this Python API. We also have a command line tool that allows you to kind of deal with versioning of software and update it and see which atlases are implemented. At the moment, we have about a dozen atlases implemented. Uh, most of them at the moment are for mice, but there's also a Marvel Zebrafish Atlas from the Max Planck Institute in Munich. There's also the Allen Human Brain Atlas. Um, and we're working on quite a few different atlases in collaboration with um, different groups that are developing these. So um, a rat atlas, hopefully we'll be out soon. There's a couple of primate atlases that people are working on and also some bird atlases. Um, but I can chat at the end about if people are interested in adding new atlases, how to do this. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the specific tools that we've been developing um, to solve specific analysis problems in neuroanatomy. Um, and one of these is processing of whole brain microscopy images. So traditionally people carried out histology in um, animals like mice by sectioning the tissue, imaging 2D sections, and trying to reconstruct a 3D volume. It's now gradually getting easier to acquire whole intact 3D images of a whole brain, for example, a mouse brain, um, either by using serial to photon microscopy like this is, or by carrying out light sheet microscopy in cleared tissue. This is a whole mouse brain acquired with serial photon microscopy. And if you cut it in half, you can see kind of labeled cells. So we have, we want to carry out a lot of the same analysis tasks as in conventional histology, but this is complicated because first of the data is very big. Um, these images can be hundreds of gigabytes up to a terabyte for a single image. Um, but also there's a lot, there can be a lot of artifacts and just the signal can vary a lot throughout the brain. There can be lots of autofluorescence, there can be stitching artifacts and just um, kind of the characteristics of the image can vary hugely in different brain areas. So we wanted to develop software to allow us to process this data 
um, in kind of relatively quick way. Um, and the first thing that we developed was an efficient method for cell detection in these large images. Because um, typically what a lot of people want to do in these whole brain images is detect cells throughout the brain and map their positions. And um, this is useful for lots of experiments. In this case, this data here is um, um, retrograde tracing. It's um, rabies tracing experiment. Um, viruses injected into retrospinal cortex. And then we're looking to map the presynaptic inputs to this region. So we want is um, an accurate way of mapping the position of every single cell in the brain. Um, we're requiring 3D data, so we want to do this in 3D, so we don't kind of accidentally detect cells um, in more than one plane. Um, we also want to do it we want to do it accurately, and we also want to do it relatively quickly as well. These are very large data sets, um, but we want to be able to analyze them on a standard desktop computer and without spending, without waiting for days for the analysis, because we want to be able to iterate quickly um, and move on to the next experiment. And the first thing we tried carrying out kind of classical um, image processing techniques, the kind of thing you might be familiar with using Fiji and ImageJ and cell profile and tools like that, um, spatial filters and intensity thresholds. And in some areas, these work very well, but often these brains have lots of artifacts. The signal to noise varies a lot. And there are specific areas that often have quite high signal. So the image on the right here, the blood vessel has um, quite, a few, quite high autofluorescence and there's often meninges remaining on the surface of the brain if there's some tissue damage that can also get picked up. And so it's very difficult to come up with a kind of a classical image processing method that picks up every cell, but also doesn't pick up lots of artifacts. And now kind of machine learning and deep learning represents the state of the art for image analysis. And it works very well on this type of data. You can get very good segmentation results. But if you're familiar with deep learning, you'll know that it's computationally very expensive. And um, you can chop up the brain into lots of different pieces and feed it into a deep learning network, but it can take a very long time, potentially kind of days or even weeks for a single brain. And so we wanted some analysis method that was um, as quick as kind of the classical image processing, but has the same accuracy as uh, modern deep learning algorithms. And what we realized is that if we could reduce the amount of data that we fed into a deep learning network, we could speed it up. And we thought that if we take, um, if we run a classical image processing algorithm, but tune it such that it, maybe we reduce the threshold so much that it picks up every single cell without any false negatives, but it also picks up lots of artifacts as well. So here on the surface of the brain and also in the blood vessels, we can get a map of cell-like objects, so any, what we call them cell candidates, any objects of approximately the right size and shape to be a cell. And this basically gives us a map of all the places in the image which are difficult to analyze and might need another pass. And then for each of these objects, what we do is we um, go in and generate a small amount of training data. So for a few of these different cell candidates, we go in and manually classify it as either being a cell, mark here in yellow, or an artifact here in purple. And then we can apply this classification algorithm to small patches of data around each of these cell candidates to um, classify them as either being a cell, again here in yellow, or artifacts here in purple. So you should hopefully be able to see that the real cells are picked out in yellow, um, and the artifacts here in the blood vessel are highlighted in purple and again on the surface of the brain. And this dual step approach means that we can analyze data very quickly, we can map um, for a whole tracing experiment in a mouse brain, kind of a few hundred gigabyte image, we can map tens of thousands of cells on a standard desktop computer in maybe a couple of hours. Um, but it also means the generation of training data is much quicker. Typically for these deep learning algorithms, you may have to kind of paint into the image, sort of mark lots of voxels that are um, typical of cells and background areas. Or you might have to painstakingly go in and draw around each of these cells in 3D. But with this approach, you can run the software through with the trained model that we provide, and then you just need to go in and correct a few mistakes because it's a simple binary choice of cell or artifact. And so it's a simple choice game between yes or no, cell or artifact. So you can generate quite good training data sets for new, completely new data the network hasn't seen in kind of five or 10 minutes. And then the next software we've been developing is called BrainReg, which is for the registration of whole brain microscopy images to an atlas. Um, 
because we have these large images and we want to be able to divide the image up into all the different brain regions. Um, and this is nothing new. There's lots of software that exists to do this kind of thing. Um, but what's different about, slightly different about ours is we can, because it's based on the Brain Globe Atlas API, we can use multiple atlases. So traditionally, we would always use, in mice here again, use the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas, um, which is very good and it's very high quality, but it has a few limitations. There are certain regions that are not well annotated. So here in this image, you can hopefully see a little bright line, and this is a, um, a label of neuropixels probe, an electrophysiological probe labeled with by eye implanted into visual cortex. And we want to know whether it's in monocular or binocular V1. Um, unfortunately, the Allen mouse brain atlas doesn't have any division, so we can't tell which one it's in. Um, but by using the software, we can use a different annotation. So we can use here the enhanced and unified mouse brain atlas from Young C. Kim's lab, which does have annotation as well, a few extra areas, but also between monocular V1 and binocular. So we can see by using this atlas, um, we can see that the probe and therefore all the recording sites are in monocular V1. And it's not that any particular atlas is necessarily better than others, it's just that they are complementary and have different annotations. And so different atlases are better for different projects, and it's useful to be able to switch between them depending on what you're doing. And then we brought both of these pipelines together to develop the CellFinder software. So this is software that allows you to do fully automated processing of whole brain images, um, including mice, but principal works on any species uh, for which we have an atlas. And so you can do um, efficient 3D cell detection in the whole brain. So these are all of these white dots. Then you can segment the brain based on the registration to an atlas, and then assign each of these cells to a brain region. And so you can carry out quite easy quantitative comparisons, whether you have more cells in certain brain areas than others, or whether these distributions change between different um, treatment groups or the other experimental groups. And it also allows us to go in and validate the methods as well, because we can kind of sort of by eye look in a few areas and see how well it's doing, but what we really want is a quantitative comparison. We want to see whether the results will change if we were using this automated approach maybe versus the gold standard of a manual approach. And so for a couple of brains, this is what we did. Um, we acquired data on a, in a different experiment using um, a different microscope than was used to originally train the network in this software. And we've got two experts to go through and painstakingly count every single cell um, and to count how many cells there are in each brain area. Um, and so we plotted this on the x-axis. This is the average of two um, experts. And on the y-axis, um, plotted the cell counts per brain area um, from CellFinder. So each of these dots here in the top plot in blue are the number of cells found by experts in the x-axis and on the y-axis by cell finder. And we get a very good um, correlation of most of these regions fall along a straight line, um, although we get a slight overestimation. So the slope of this line is 1.11. So we get about this, the software predicts about 10% more cells in each brain area than um, experts. Um, and crucially, in brain one, this is data that was used to retrain the network, but in brain two, this was a different brain not used to train the network, and we get similar results. We get a slight overestimation. But what's important in these experiments, especially these kind of rabies tracing experiments, it's not the absolute number of cells that are labeled, because that can vary depending on lots of experimental conditions like viral titer and injection volume. What's important is the correlation. We want to know whether the relative number of cells in each brain area um, is an influence and isn't biased by the software, especially kind of dense areas or uh, much more sparsely labeled regions. And so we looked at the correlation between the expert counts and manual counts. And in both cases, we get a very good correlation of 0.99. So we can be pretty confident that the relative number of cells in each brain area um, from the software matches very well to what you do if you were to go through and count all of these manuals. And then moving on to some more software that, we, that we've developed, um, BrainReg Segment is kind of a companion software to BrainReg that allows you to not segment individual cells, but allows you to segment out bulk structures. Things like um, viral injection sites, um, lesion sites or large implant things like optical fibers or um, recording um, Equipment things like electrophysiological probes, in this case, um, neuropixels probes. Um, modern systems neuroscience now relies a lot 
on precise placement of various things like whether they're viral injections or recording devices. And it's very important to be able to both um, allocate each of these structures to a specific brain area. So you then know if you've tried to inject a certain region that that's the region you hit. But it's also important to be able to warp all of these detected structures back into atlas space. So we can see here in this middle section of the optical fiber, these optical fibers um, were aimed at the tail of the striatum. And we can see that although the actual kind of trajectory through brain space is varying between these three and blue, yellow, and um, red, the end of the probe, which is the recording site for fiber photometry, is actually hitting exactly the same region. So we can be confident that we are recording from the same population of cells. And on the right here, these are three um, neuropixel probes injections from three separate mice warped to the same coordinate space. And we can see that they're both, all three of them are hitting um, B1, and the end of the probe is in a similar position. But we are recording from different cellular populations from slightly different areas of B1. So this allows us to know exactly where we are in 3D space and where each of these recording sites are. And it's very important with these kind of modern um, large scale electrophysiological probes to map where every single uh, recording site is. Um, so this is what we did for kind of, this is a manual segmentation software. So we um, got three people to manually track a neuropixels probe, which is the cartoon here on the left. And then we can use this to assign each of these recording sites to a different um, layer in, well, firstly in primary visual cortex as the probe goes through, so layer one, two, three, four, five, um, and six, and also in the fiber tracks and hippocampus. And we can assign each of these recording sites to a specific region. Um, and we did this with three raters, um, who each repeated it five times, and we get fairly good results. So we can see that it's not too Im impacted by um, who does this analysis or when. But then what this information also gives us is we can carry out kind of multimodal validation of our registration. Because we don't just have the anatomy, we don't have the anatomical segmentation, we can also look at the um, electrophysiological data that we get to compare the two. So if we look along the probe and we um, measure the LFP power as we go down through the cortex in the hippocampus, we can see the LFP power varies. There's an increase here at this gray um, arrow as the probe goes into the campus. And there's also a well, like a landmark in the middle of layer five. There's a peak in LFP power here in the middle of the layer. And what we can do is across different brains and different um, experts using this software, we can see how the anatomical landmarks compare to the electrophysiological landmarks. Um, and so for each of these plots here, we have the three raters using the software. And we get relatively good results. We get an average about a 60 micron discrepancy for this specific landmark between the electrophysiological landmark of the middle of layer five and what we get from the anatomy. Um, and when these um, probe site, probe recording sites kind of tens of microns apart, um, we're quite happy that this is relatively good, um, quite good accuracy. Um, but we have noticed that there's a slight kind of um, systematic bias towards underestimating the length of the probe. Um, and this is likely because this DI labeling is very difficult to pick up at the exact end of the probe. So then we talk about some analysis tools, but we also want to visualize these, um, these data. We've registered that we can segment these data, whether they're cells or whether they are um, large implanted devices, but we want to visualize them in a common space. We might have data from different experimental modalities, or we might have data from different um, different animals, and we want to merge them together. And so um, Federico Claudi at the Central Welcome Center has developed Brain Render, um, which allows you to visualize data in any of these atlas spaces supported by Brain Group. So we can visualize um, atlas data in a mouse here, um, in humans, or in this example, um, larval zebrafish. And it's a nice example of how the Brain Globe software works. So if you're using Brain Render, um, it, has a, it has a GUI, but also has a Python API. Um, and here's the code to render the mouse image on the top left. We import this scene from Brain Render, and we tell it which atlas we want to use. In this case, we're using, again, the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas. We want to render a couple of brain regions. And this shows these two brain regions in their default colors. And then this is the code for doing exactly the same in the zebrafish larvae in the bottom left. And we do use exactly the same code, import the same scene. We just say we want to use a different um, atlas, in this case, the zebra, Marvel Zebrafish Atlas. We want to visualize two regions again, exactly the same. And we get the same kind of plot. 
And this is what we're aiming for. We're aiming for software where it doesn't matter what atlas you're using or what species you're using, you should be able to use the same software. You might be able to, might need to tweak some settings, for example, because scale is different and maybe the imaging modality is different. But if you just want to visualize um, atlas data, you should be able to use exactly the same software. And so if you do your PhD in Zebrafish, for example, and you then do your postdoc in a mouse lab, you will have a set of tools and a set of knowledge that you can take with you. You don't have to learn a completely new set of tools. Um, and Brain Render as well allows us to do um, more complicated visualizations. We can make nice movies, um, but we can also bring in data from other sources. So this is a mouse brain um, with the retrosplenial cortex rendered in blue. We've carried out a rabies tracing experiment by injecting virus into the retrosplenial cortex. And then all the little dots you can see, these are cells detected by cell finding. So we can look at the presynaptic inputs to retrosplenial. But then we can also look at data from elsewhere. So all of the blue lines, these are streamlines from the um, Allen Brain Institute's um, anterograde tracing project. So we can directly compare in a single model how our retrograde tracing results compare to their tracing results. And you can do this again with data from the Allen or from the Mouse Light project or from the Max Planck Zebrafish Atlas. And you can pull the data from as many different animals as you want because they're all registered to the same space. Um, and so now kind of based on these tools that we've already released and published and now starting to build um, new different tools. So another tool that Federico is building is Probe Planner, which is built on top of Brain Render. Um, and the idea of this is rather than just um, implanting devices or injecting animals and then using brain red segment to be able to map where these structures are in the brain after the experiment, you can use these 3D atlases to plan your experiments. So in the same way you might carry it out using a paper atlas, you can go in and plan the trajectory of your probe or your implant to see exactly which brain structures it's going to go through. So you can plan to maybe you want to hit specific brain regions because you have recording sites along a probe, or maybe you want to completely avoid other regions to make sure you don't damage them. And also um, working with um, Nick Del Grosso and Johnny Cole's lab at the Crick, um, they're developing Slice Ridge. So this is a, essentially the 2D companion to Brain Ridge, but when you don't have 3D whole brain microscopy data, you only have 2D data, um, you can register your 2D sections into the 3D atlas so you can get more um, data of different types into this same coordinate space. And then the last software I'm going to talk about is um, some of the Napari plugins that we've been making. So if you haven't, if you're not familiar with Napari, it's a relatively new uh, multi-dimensional image viewer written in Python. And there's a lot of labs now are developing plugins for this software. You can kind of think of basic kind of Python version of ImageJ. And the reason that it exists is to provide efficient visualization of um, data, including biological image data, um, but also to allow you to leverage kind of the existing ecosystem for data analysis and machine learning in Python. And so we're starting to move all of our tools into Napari plugins. So you can chain them all together and have a nice user interface, nice graphical user interface, but it'll also allow you to interact with other software that might not necessarily be built for neuroanatomy, things like cell segmentation and clustering algorithms, but you can bring them in, you can use them with our other software and use them for neuroanatomy data. And so the last thing I'm going to talk about is not in specific tools, but kind of now the kind of the aims of BrainGlobe is that we want to build an open source community. There's lots of people who have developed great neuroanatomy analysis software and visualization software, but it often ends up being abandoned because software development in academia tends to be linked to grants and papers. And when people develop some software, it gets released, the paper comes out, and at some point, through no fault of anyone, it ends up being abandoned. And we're trying to make this, we're trying to build an open source community of people who are working together to build interoperable tools that will sustain itself um, long after anyone who maybe started the project will leave the project. And we're doing a relatively good job, I think, so far, kind of still within the first year of releasing most a lot of this software. Um, these slides are a little bit old, but we have kind of over 20 different repositories that probably reflect about a dozen user facing tools. Um, 20 something different contributors to the code from maybe a dozen different universities. Um, and they're being downloaded, I think about four, uh, four and a half thousand times a month, which we're pretty happy with. 
Um, there's a lot more work to do to try and um, basically get people to buy into this system. Um, the first thing to do is to try and develop additional atlases. So partnering with people who are using brain atlases or developing brain atlases to bring them into the ecosystem. Because if you don't have an atlas for your specific species that you're interested in, um, these tools are not immediately useful for you. We also want to get people to use these core tools. I mean, you don't need to join BrainGlobe or anything or commit to making your software interoperable. But if you use, for example, the BrainGlobe Atlas API to deal with brain atlases, we should hopefully save you a lot of time. You don't have to um, deal with hosting these atlases yourself. You don't need to deal with um, versioning them. You don't need to write all the code to interact with them. And then for free, your software ends up being fairly compatible with our software because anything you export into these Atlas spaces will automatically use the same conventions that we do. And so we can better compare our software and kind of break down some of the barriers between the software. We're also looking for people to contribute to these open source packages for specific analysis and visualization packages. But then we also want to work towards helping biologists adopt these tools. And one of the main things to do is to develop nice user-friendly and intuitive graphical user interfaces for these software and also help people use them as much as possible and write as good documentation as we can. Um, and then lastly, just a bit of an advert. Um, next month, we're running a hackathon um, kind of joint with UCL, um, where anyone is invited and all the core developers from BrainGlobe will be there and lots of people who are working on other tools. And the idea is we can just have a single day where people can work together on specific projects um, and see if we can try and onboard as many people as possible and start moving some of the um, projects that I haven't mentioned here further. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I just want to say that this is a very collaborative project uh, with lots of people um, been working on these tools. The cell detection and the 3D atlas registration was started um, in Troy Margulies lab by Charlie Rousseau and Christian Niederock. Um, the 3D visualization and the pro planner was led by Federico Claudi in Thiago Branco's lab. The atlas API um, was collaboration with, again with Federico, but also Luigi Petruco in Ruben Portuguese's lab. Um, over in Munich, and the 2D Atlas registration work that I showed briefly um, is carried out by Nick Dogrosso in Johnny Cole's lab. I'll put it quick. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, um, happy to answer them. Or if you want to get in contact, there are various links. Um, hope you can see them. My face is over some of them, I think. Um, but we have a website, we have which is brainglobe.info. There's a GitHub page where all the code is github.com slash brainglobe. Um, but you're also welcome to get in contact with me either by email or however. Um, yes, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. This was great. Uh, we are, um, as people know, and I wrote already on the on the chat. If you have questions, please put them on the chat. Um, in the meantime, if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. First of all, this is. Amazing. I mean, I don't cannot imagine the amount of work like to put all these tools together. Like, congratulations. I think it's such an amazing work. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask is, are you guys planning to move also into electron microscopy data for neuroanatomy and so on? Because like a lot of this, you get a lot of the benefits of not having to do things manually and, and in electron microscopy, if you're trying to trace cells and so on, you know, like there is a lot of this manual tracing and volumes and so on? Yeah, so one of the kind of the main, I think, bottlenecks of getting data into this ecosystem, the first one I mentioned is atlases, and then the other one is registration, because you need to register your data into the atlas somehow. And this works very well for light microscopy, it works well for MRI, because that's how the atlases um, typically are made. For other modalities like EM, um, it's a bit harder. It kind of depends on what species you're working in. I think if you're working in zebrafish, for example, you can get quite large, well, relatively large EM data sets or kind of data sets from synchrotron. If you're working in mice, then the registration becomes a lot harder because you've just got relatively small cubes. Um, so it's all about kind of developing registration algorithms. And one of the aims is to extend BrainReg to work with data from completely different um, imaging modalities and have kind of sensible preset options. We can use different registration backends to basically, yeah, try and warp as many data sets as we can into the Atlas. And then once you're in the Atlas space, you can then use all the other tools. Uh, cool. Okay. 
Thanks. Uh, so we have a question from people that are watching. Um, the question is from Matthias Zendina and is asking, what do you think are the largest barriers to adoption of this ecosystem as, as standard software? Is it the computation, the lack of user interfaces, the difficulty of installation? Um, so I think installation is something we've worked quite hard on. It's relatively, it's relatively easy. Um, I think the biggest stumbling block at the moment is that most of our tools, you need a Python environment to use. Um, and that's why I'm quite heavily invested in using Napari because they are developed, well, you can install Napari just with a, a standalone tool. You don't need the Python environment. And they will also work as a package manager. So you can download these software packages within Napari uh, mm -hmm. without ever touching the command line or really even knowing you're using Python. Okay. Um, so the aim is to kind of try and adopt existing standards out there and um, work with other tools that are doing things like this very well. Okay, cool. Um, so I think Matthias took a little while to like follow up on his question, but he also asks, is it because people mostly use 2D sections with a lot of artifacts? So slicing artifacts and damage and so on, like how? Yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, 2D registration is a, is a pretty hard problem. Um, there are a lot of good tools out there. Um, 3D registration of whole brain images seems very difficult, but actually it's a relatively well-constrained project. Uh, mm -hmm. constrained problem. 2D data is a lot more complicated. As I mentioned, okay. artifacts, different resolutions. Um, mm -hmm. and so one solution isn't going to probably fit all. We'll probably need manual registration and a number of different automated algorithms for different data sets. Okay, cool. Um, I, you, you showed a, um, a graph where you had a cell finder and the algorithms that you use to find more cells that they and the algorithms that you use, they find more cells in the specialist. And I was wondering if this is simply because like the, the, the networks are just doing a better job than the specialists. And I ask this because like there are papers showing that for instance, in radiology, there are now like trained networks that find that are better at diagnosing things than actually the actual radi radiologists. Is this something like along those lines, what is happening here or? Yeah, I mean, so it's obviously so something we can't really, um investigate too well because i mean the only ground truth we have is getting experts to go through these images and count them um mm. but that has lots of potential um, mistakes it's I mean, it's incredibly boring for one and people make mistakes it's hard to segment things like identify things in 3d and it's fluorescence mm. imaging so the intensity varies um the only information we do have on this is there is the difference between the algorithm and the expert counters is of basically exactly the same um, order as the difference between two experts. Mm. Um, so I think it's as good as we, we can, we can't quantify any better until we start getting um, better ground truth data. Okay, cool. That's interesting. Um, one question. So you shared all these links, which are amazing. And we can put actually all of them also in the video description if you want mm -hmm. later. Um, yeah. But I, the question that I had, is there a forum or something where people can like come in and ask questions and, Yes. So if um, the we have a website that I actually made yesterday, which is brainglobe.info. And on there, mm -hmm. there is a link to a forum. And we've um, partnered with the image.se forum, which is used by lots of um, much bigger open source tools like Fiji and Cell Profiler. So there is a, um, a Brain Globe. We're a community partner on there. And if you tag Brain Globe or any of the individual tools, um, yeah, we'll see messages and we're happy to answer any questions. Ah, cool. Okay, that's great. Um, and another question: If I want to start using the tools tomorrow, like or today, like what is the best, what is the best way to do it? Like as a biologist, like what do I need to download first? Like how do I need to prepare my data? I know that this is probably all in the documentation, but I think if you give like a thirty-second pitch for people, I think this would be interesting as well. So if we talk about whole brain microscopy data, because that's what a lot of our user-facing tools are. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the thirty-second pitch is have Python installed. Um, pip install cell finder, which will fetch everything for you. And then you give cell finder the path to your data and you tell it the voxel sizes and then that's it. And then you will get a spreadsheet out, which will tell you how many cells you have in each brain area. Um, but then you can load your data into Napari and then you can curate your results and maybe and retrain the network. Okay, so it seems like pretty straightforward actually. Um, even though you're saying that you still like want to work and make it even more straightforward, it doesn't seem that you have a lot of steps to get your data into the system. 
Yeah, it's not difficult to use, but it can be a lot more intuitive when it comes to tweaking parameters. If it works well, it's great. Um, mm -hmm. But using kind of software on the command line, if you need to tweak lots of parameters, um, that's where the graphical user interface is a much more useful piece of feedback on how changing the parameters works. Okay, cool. Um... And so, like, this is more of a of a on the background question. Um, how are you coordinating all these labs and all these people? Because since we are highlighting open source tools, we always have questions that are trying to show people like what goes in the backstage. Because this is something that people don't realize that it's a lot of effort to do the non technical side of open source projects, right? And you show like collaboration with many labs and and different data sets and so on. And this is hard to coordinate. And so I was wondering if you had like a few words about it. Yeah, so we're trying to get around this problem by having kind of well, requiring as little um, coordination as possible, because what we don't want to happen is that if the core developers leave, the whole project falls apart. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, if you write your software with the BrainGlobe Atlas API, so however you work with your software, if the data ends up in that coordinate space as defined by the API, and it will then be compatible with the rest of the software. Um, so the idea is that we have very loose bindings between the different software. These are the tools that we've developed, but we're hoping that other people will develop them and they can bring them in. They can be official brand globe tools or they can run them completely separately. But if they use the Atlas API, then everything will be in the coordinate space and you can visualize everything together. So we're trying mm -hmm. to get around this problem by not by coordinating it as little as possible, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> coordination by non-coordination, basically. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, I think yeah, I think these are most of the questions that we had for you today. Is there anything else that you would like to add? No, just that's it. But if anyone wants to um, get in contact with me, my details are here. Or um, yeah, and we have a forum as well. Anyone's welcome to ask questions. Um, if they end up using this data a few months, using these tools a few months, we're happy to answer questions. Then. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for making the time again. And thanks for presenting and all this work, which is really cool. Uh, thanks to all, all of the people who are who have joined us today. Um, and thanks for Worldwide Series and the people, the people organizing Open Neuroscience um, for organizing these things, because this is also a community effort. Thank you. Right. Thanks for inviting me. Welcome. So yeah, I'm going to wait for the transmission to catch up and then close the transmission. And again, thank you very much. Um, no bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.